all the way on the left you see so the topic of today is our ismara web server and ismara is a tool for automatically inferring gene regulatory circuitry from high throughput data that you can upload to the website so the website he, uh, this is its address ismara.univas.ch and if you could go there then this is the page you will see and uh, basically what you can do is you can upload files here and or you can upload uh, ids of data sets in the uh, sra database and uh, all you really then have to do is hit go you might need to say what the species is from which your data uh, derives you can give an email address and a project name this is for your own reference and the email address is so that you will get an automated notification when your uh, data has been analyzed i note also to the left here there is a login this is we have some um, uh, users from industry um, that license is Mara to be run um, in a way that protects their data and keeps their data secure. And so we also have this, this licensing scheme for, from, for commercial users. But for academic users, you don't need to log in, you can just upload your data. All right, so let me try to start uh, motivating uh, why we developed this tool and what is basically the main idea behind it. So one of the key things that my lab is very interested in is understanding how the regulatory code in the DNA uh, is read out by cells to control cell fate and identity. So the kind of questions that we're interested in in my group is how do gene regulatory networks function as systems um, what is a cell type is there even something like a cell type can you rigorously find what this mean how is cell identity stabilized what is the key information that specifies cell identity and what are all the details that don't matter and uh, we know that in the end this is all essentially determined by constellations of regulatory sites in the genome because it's easy to forget if you look at these pictures of uh, different human cell types that these are all created from the same underlying blueprint the same genome so we will we would like to sort of understand at the system level how this works and when I came into this field about sort of uh, 20 years ago maybe a tiny bit more uh, I was very excited because we had first become able to sequence whole genomes and we had developed technology in those days. This was microarray technology to measure gene expression of all genes in parallel in cells. And um, coming from a physics background, I thought, well, now that we can get all this data, we have the whole genome, we can measure the expression of all genes. It's just a matter of developing some good models, and then we're going to understand how all of this works. And so one of the things I wanted to tell you about is that sort of in the last um, five to seven years or so, I have uh, developed um, a syndrome which uh, is known in psychology research as the Dunning-Kruger effect. And this slide is illustrating what this uh, Dunning-Kruger effect is. So it shows um, the confidence that a person has in their ability to solve a particular problem as a function of how much they have studied this problem. And uh, people that uh, have not studied a problem at all, they also start out having low confidence in their ability to, to solve a particular problem. But as they start studying a particular topic, people find that um, individuals tend to get much more confident very quickly about their ability in a particular field. And so their confidence starts quickly rising. However, there comes a point uh, where they've studied the topic enough so that they start getting a sense of how many things there still are that they know nothing about and that are also very important to know about if they are going to solve this problem. And then uh, their confidence may suddenly start dropping precipitously. 
And so I put a picture here to show, show you that I'm essentially still going down on this downslide of confidence. I have come to believe that uh, the problem of understanding what is really going on on a genome-wide level in eukaryotic cells and how they regulate their cell identity is currently way beyond our abilities to solve. And why do I believe that? Well, we think we know how to measure a lot nowadays about the state of a cell, but there are in fact uh, many, there are orders of magnitude more things going on inside a cell that we do know not how to measure and we do not know about. And so we're nowhere near the ability to write down a model for everything that's going on in the cell. And moreover, the high throughput measurements that we take are full of artifacts and biases that often are poorly understood. And third, uh, data analysis in this field often involves dizzying arrays of normalizations and filters and transformations. So at the end, it's very, very hard to understand how the results of the analysis even relate to the raw data that went in. And so this is all worrying me a lot. And, um, the approach that we developed came out of this worry and um, basically means that we want to take a humble position and say, there is no way we're gonna really understand everything that's going on in the regulation of cell identity and cell faith. All we want to do is develop methods that are robust and transparent, that are relatively simple and that can use high throughput data to help guide experimental efforts. That is to basically provide experimentalists with results that are useful for them to learn where to focus their next experimental efforts. All right, so this is really the main uh, goal of the methods is to extract from the high throughput data hypotheses that can then be followed up on by further experimental work. All right, was there a question? No? Okay. All right, so um, the kind of problem that we have focused on is, is a problem that we have collaborated with lots of experimental groups on in the past. And these groups are interested in knowing um, what high throughput transcriptome or epigenome data says about the regulation that is going on in their system of interest. Okay, so here I have a couple of pictures of some um, systems um, that we've worked with some experimental groups on. And the typical questions that people are interested in are questions are, what are the key regulators in my system? What are the roles of these regulators? which are the pathways that are targeted by each of these regulators and so on. And the challenge for an experimental group is that it's impossible to do saturating genetic screens. So it's impossible, let's say human has about 2000 transcription factors. It also has many hundreds of, of um, families of microRNAs. And so to investigate them all, all experimentally would be, uh, it would wait, be way too much experimental to do, to check out each one of them. However, it's relatively easy to do high throughput measurements of gene expression, let's say in a time course or under certain perturbations or in different conditions. One can do RNA-seq or chip-seq or some people also still do microarrays. And the problem that many experimentalists face is that they do not have the expertise to analyze such data. And so they have to collaborate uh, somebody unmute their mic. So please remember, if you don't have a question, keep your mic muted. All right, so we basically wanted to develop a tool that ha help experimentalists analyze their own data. So to just give you a, a sort of a contrast of our approach with typical approaches, is that some of the most common approaches to the analysis of transcriptome data is you first do basic processing, so you map your reads to transcripts, you find all genes that are dispersed, and then, for example, you use a tool like DESEC to find which genes are differentially expressed uh, across the conditions. Another thing that you can, that is often done, 
is to cluster genes into groups with similar expression profiles. So you use some sort of clustering algorithm. In this case, here is a hierarchical clustering done that groups genes together in groups that are um, expressed in a similar way. And then downstream of this, you can do things like look at these groups of genes and ask what kind of pathways or categories are overrepresented among these co-regulated genes. So here's an example for a, a data set of liver development that we will look at later on, where um, there are genes found that are expressed early and late in, in, in development. And then when you look at uh, overexpressed, sorry, enriched categories of genes among those sets, you find these various categories. Now the limitations of such approaches is that these approaches tell you which genes are changing their expression and you may even find what groups of genes are changing their expression together, but they don't tell you anything about what's going on with respect to the regulation. It doesn't tell you what the regulators are or how they are regulating these genes. And so it's often difficult to follow up on this experimentally, right? So you may find that there's a group of 100 genes that are a co-regulated module, but how do you go and now validate this experimentally? This is not so clear. All right, so what our uh, MARA approach does is that after you've uploaded the data, it will identify for you what are the key regulators, transcription factors and microRNAs in your system, what are the activities of these regulators across the samples that you uploaded, what are the sets of target genes and pathways of each of these regulators? What are the regulatory sites on the genome through which these regulators act? And also, what are hypothesized direct interactions between the different important regulators in your system? All right, so this slide here summarizes uh, conceptually how this approach works. So in the top left is a part of the analysis that is all pre-calculated before you submit your data. So before you submit your data, we've made a annotation of all the transcripts and promoters in the genome of uh, your organism of interest. And we also have a collection of um, motifs for transcription factor and microRNAs that mathematically represent what kind of sites each of these transcription factors and microRNAs bind. We've used this to make an annotation of binding sites in the promoters and, and microRNA sites in the 3' UTR of all genes. And so this gives us pre-calculated this matrix, which has for each promoter and each motif um, binding sites um, predicted, right? The way we've done this <clears throat> is so in the first step, we take um, collections of uh, experimentally measured transcription start sites. So in the past, we've collaborated with the Riken Institute in Japan where that have done such measurements uh, at great depth in uh, human and mouse. And so we use those um, cage data to define uh, transcription star sites. And we associate them with transcripts by using collections of full length mRNAs, for example, from GenCode or Ensemble. And so uh, we cluster the known starts of mRNAs. So here are a couple of examples of um, isoforms of a gene. And so there is a some of these isoforms start here, some of these isoforms have starts over here, and some isoforms have start over here. And then we cluster these starts with um, promoters that we have annotated. So these here show promoters on the genome that they have derived from this cage data. All right. And so we basically cluster these groups of cage TSSs with starts of mRNAs that are associated with. All right, for predicting these transcription factor binding sites, we have uh, curated a large collection of so-called position-specific weight matrices um, that represent the binding specificity of transcription factors. So here are four examples of transcription factors with sequence logos of their weight matrices. 
And as some of you uh, may know, uh, the weight matrix representation is basically a matrix of probabilities. So um, components W, I, alpha give the probability of finding a base alpha at position I of the site. So here as an example, I've shown an alignment of binding sites of the transcription factor through R from E. coli. And so yeah, you can look down in each column what are the letters that occur at that position of the site. And at this position of the site, for example, C is the most common letter to occur. All right, so if you look at the relative frequencies of the different letters at this column, you will see that uh, A occurs in 6%, C 53%, G 27%, and T 13%. And so this weight matrix says, if you have a binding site, the probability that at position four there will be an A is 6%, a C 53%, a G 27%, and a T 13%. And so we find these probabilities for all sites, in a trans, uh, for all positions in the transcription factor. And so given that, one can now calculate the probability that the binding site for this weight matrix will be sequence S, which is just the product of these probabilities over all positions. All right, so we use this weight matrix present, uh, representation together with a tool that we have developed previously in the lab. So my lab has worked for a long time on computational methods for predicting these transcription factor binding sites. And this call, a tool is called Motivo. And the key thing that it does is that for each promoter region in the genome, so here is a promoter with a transcription start, we take 500 base pairs upstream to 500 base pairs downstream. So we take a one kilobase region. Then we find the orthologous kilobase regions in related species. So when we're making an annotation from human, we collect orthologous regions from mouse, dog, cow, horse, rhesus macaque, and opossum. We build an alignment of these orthologous promoter regions. We also know the phylogenetic tree that relates human and these other species. And basically this gives us a model of what kind of conservation patterns we expect for positions that are evolving neutrally. And also what kind of patterns we expect to see when a segment of the alignment is a binding site for a particular transcription factor. All right, so this is a fairly sophisticated Bayesian model. I will not go into the details. Um, I'm just um, telling you here that we use this previously developed tool to scan all the promoter regions. So typically there are 20, 30,000 sort of promoters in a mammalian genome. So we scan all of them with uh, the weight matrices of a few hundred uh, transcription factors to predict binding sites in these genomes, uh, in each of these promoters. <clears throat> so actually these binding site annotations, we also provide publicly <clears throat> in a database, which is called Swiss Regulon, you can find here. So if you go to this database, you can either download them, these uh, annotations, but you can also uh, browse them in a genome browser. So here's an example of one promoter uh, with the start of a transcript and you, these little red squares that you see or rectangles, they are predicted binding sites for transcription factors in this promoter. And so for each binding site, the name of the transcription factor is indicated and the intensity of the color indicates the probability that we assign that is a functional binding site. And this probability is, is based both on how well it matches the motif and on the conservation statistics that we see across um, other related species. And so for MARA, we now summarize all these transcript factor binding site prediction in all the promoters by a big matrix, which we call the site count matrix, where the component uh, NPM corresponds to the total number of binding sites for motif M in promoter P. So it's a count of the number of functional sites for motif M in promoter P. And so you should imagine that if there are 30,000 promoters, this matrix has 30,000 rows and it has, we have about 600 transcription factors or motifs 
600 columns. All right, so apart from transcription factors, we also include regulation by microRNAs. I will not go into a lot of details now, but microRNAs, their binding uh, is mainly determined by matching to what's called a, a, a seed sequence at the uh, um, five prime end of uh, the microRNA, uh, the eight base pairs of five prime end, the microRNA, and we also use a previously developed microRNA target prediction method here to predict binding sites for microRNAs in the three prime UTRs of transcripts. And so these are also summarized in, a, uh, in additional columns of the site count matrix. So now each column mu correspond to one of 86 seed families that we have in a human and it um, predicts the number of sites for motif mu in transcripts associated with promoter P. All right, um, this is just to note that we've recently did a big overhaul of our um, regulatory site annotations and collection of motifs using data from uh, the Fontem 5 collaboration in which we took part. And so what we did is we started with a very large collection of regulatory motifs from various uh, collections, so our own collection, Swiss Regular on Jasper, Ocomog, Homer, Unipro, Enco, and HD Silex are all different databases of motifs. We combine them all together, but when you combine them all together, you get a very, very um, redundant set of regulatory motifs. You tend to get multiple motifs from different databases for the same transcription factor. And then basically what we, what we did is we ran our Ismara tool on this very large collection of samples from human and mouse that was gathered in uh, the Phantom 5 project to basically pick one best motif for each transcription factor. And after we've picked one best motif for each transcription factor, we then further reduced um, redundancy by collapsing together highly similar motifs that were statistically indistinguishable in this very large data set. So for example, as many as we know, there are these families of transcription factors um, that bind to very, very similar binding sites and often it's impossible to tell um, which of the members of a family is active in a given sample. So when that was the case, we, co we combined these groups, these families of um, motifs together into a single effective motif. Was there a question? I have a question. Yeah. Um, Hello, Professor. Nice presentation, and it's uh, we are listening quite nicely. Um, my question is regarding to the species. Here, this uh, whole tool of Asmara and Phantom, they are basic, uh, basically based on the human and mouse. Yeah. I was wondering, would it be possible to also go for the other species like animals or because they have a very less motive and transcrip transcription factor information? Yeah. So um, I will come to that at, at some point. So uh, when the tool was originally developed, it was developed for human and mouse. Uh, we have a version uh, for rat. We, um, it, uh, we have also versions that we can run for E. coli or yeast, so other species for which many things are known. We've recently made a version for zebrafish and we're in the development of a version for um, Drosophila. But basically, to make this effective, you do need to uh, have a collection of regulatory motifs representing transcription factors in your organism. So if really nothing is known about that, and if your organism is too distal from species for which such motifs are known, then it will be difficult to do. But if, if your organism is, is close enough that, for example, you can map orthologous transcription factors between a species for which many motifs are known and your species, then in principle, you can uh, prepare an annotation and, and run Ismara on uh, such a species too, but it requires some work. 
All right. So this is just summarizing now after we've done this um, new curation of motifs for human and mouse that um, we have uh, motifs for uh, almost 700 transcription factors in both human and mouse and about 100 microRNA families. And after redundancy removal, we have about 500 motif groups. All right. So in the results of MARA on, on, uh, on human and mouse, uh, you will get predictions for about 500 regulatory motifs. All right, so this was the pre-calculated part. Now the second part that goes into ISMARA is the actual data that is being uploaded. All right, so uh, people either provide RNA-seq data or um, microarray data. Actually, I realize now this slide is a little bit out of date. We nowadays take either raw RNA-seq data, raw chip-seq data in, in the format of FASTQ files, or even links to the SRA database, as I said. All right, so this data is taken, and then what happens, so let's take the example of RNA-seq data. We map the RNA-seq reads to the, the known transcripts in the organism, and from this, we derive another big matrix uh, which we call the expression matrix, which gives for each promoter P and each sample S the expression of this promoter in sample S. So we get an expression profile for each promoter across the samples. So how do we do this um, more specifically? Uh, so we actually make use of the Callisto tool from the group of uh, Leo Pachter. So we map uh, each RNA sequence read to the transcriptome using Callisto. And then we make a slight change um, from the way Callisto estimates gene expression um, in that we, when a read maps to multiple transcripts, we uniformly uh, distribute it over all transcripts that it's consistent with. So let me try to explain you um, how this uh, expression calculation is done. So here I've shown you one, two, three, four, five different RNA seq reads. So, and in the light blue is the transcriptome annotation. These are the various isoforms that are known uh, in this part of the genome. All right, so you see that the red transcription factor here will map to one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight different transcripts. And what we will do is we will assign this red to each of these eight and we will assign a weight of one eighth of a read to each of these transcripts. Now the blue read here only overlaps two reads. So we give both of these transcripts now a weight one half. Here the green one hits just one transcript. So we give a weight of one to this transcript and so on. And so now afterwards, I can, for each transcript, calculate a total weight, which is just the sum of the weights of all the reads that have been assigned to it. So for example, um, this transcript here at the top gets a weight one third from the orange read, a weight one sixth from the purple one, and a weight uh, one eighth from the red one. All right? So, we then divide this weight for each transcript by the length of the transcript. This gives us a new weight, capital W, of the transcript. And then for a promoter, okay, so if I take now this promoter here, this promoter is associated with multiple transcripts. So we sum all these weights of the transcripts that are transcribed from the same promoter. We then finally add a pseudo count of one half, and then we rescale all these weights to represent transcripts per million and log transform it, all right? So for each promoter, the expression that we now calculate is uh, basically the logarithm of the transcripts per million uh, that we've estimated for this promoter in this sample. All right. So 
we have this pre-calculated side counts and we have this um, from the data we calculate this expression distribution of each promoter across all samples and now we're going to apply this simple MARA model to calculate how active each regulator is in each sample. All right, so the linear model that uh, MARA uses basically um, writes the expression of each promoter P in each sample S as a sample dependent constant plus a promoter dependent constant. So this you can think of as sort of an uh, uh, average expression level of this promoter plus a sum over all motifs, the number of binding sites that this promoter has for motif M, times some unknown activity of each motif M in sample S. All right, and so what we want to infer is these motif activities. All right, so this uh, goes in a couple of steps. So first, each sample of the matrix is normalized by subtracting its mean expression. So this is a mean expression in this sample, it's just the average over all promoters. Then we get, uh, we subtract this from each column, we contract, uh, subtract its average, and we do the same for the side counts. So for each motif M, we look at the average number of binding sites across promoters, and we ex ex subtract that from the side counts. So this N till the side counts are now really the side count in promoter P for motif M minus the average number of sites for motif M, all right? So promoters without sites will now have a negative number and promoters with sites a positive number, all right? So now we model the expression for each promoter in each sample as this linear model of motif activities. And we separate this model into two parts. <coughs> so we first, we, look at the average expression of each promoter. So this is just averaging the expression across all samples. And we model that in terms of average activities of each of the motifs. So we fit the following model. We say the average expression of each promoter is given by this linear combination of the average activities of each motif times the side count in each promoter for each motif. And there is uh, some noise added to it. And second, we subtract these averages from the expression levels to basically get, get the deviations from the average expression of each promoter in each sample. And we do the same for the motif activities. So these motif, these A till the motif activities are the difference between the motif activity of each motif in sample S and its average activity of this motif. And so we also fit this model and this model basically fits the changes in expression in terms of the changes in motif activity across the samples, right? So these, uh, these normalized expression values, they're averaged to zero across all samples. And similarly, these motif activities also average to zero. All right, so now for the more technical listeners among you, I will first tell you how we technically solve this, and then I will give a more conceptual summary uh, for the less technical of you. So technically we want to, so these are the expression changes of each promoter across each of the samples. So we write this as a linear function of these motif counts and um, motif activities across the samples. And we will assume uh, that the noise, that is the deviation between the observed expression levels and the predicted one from the model is Gaussian distributed. So the probability of all the expression data uh, given the motif activities is given by such a Gaussian form. In addition to avoid overfitting, we will put a Gaussian prior on these motif activities. That is, um, and this prior is controlled by one uh, parameter lambda, which basically says how strongly you uh, suppress fluctuations in motif activities. Now, uh, because both of these are, are Gaussian, you can now easily solve this model and solve the posterior probability of the motif activities in each sample in terms of the observed 
expression values and this parameter lambda of the prior and it's given by a form uh, like this where so it's a multivariate Gaussian where the precision matrix of the multivariate Gaussian is in fact given by the covariance matrix of the side counts plus a term coming from the prior and um, the variance here in the denominator is just the chi squared it's the difference between the observed motif sorry the observed expression values and the predicted expression values uh, at the optimal motif activities so it's a measure of uh, how far the data deviates from the uh, optimal fit model and the parameter lambda of the prior is optimized through cross validation so what we do is we randomly select 80% of the promoters uh, to fit the motif activities and then use the remaining 20% of the promoters as a training set and we then tweak lambda until uh, the quality of the prediction on the training set is maximized. All right, now um, for the less technical of you, I will tell you what is conceptually the model so conceptually, the model is that um, we're going to model the expression of each promoter in each sample as a linear function of, a, so it's a sum across all motifs. How many binding sites does this promoter have for, motif, for each motif M times how active is each motif M in sample S, all right? And so we basically fit these motif activities so as to uh, optimally predict the observed expression values, right? So these are the ones that, that come from the data that were submitted. These binding sites counts, we pre-calculated. And so these motif activity ones are the one, motif activities are now the ones we're going to infer. And we're inferring for each sample, both a fitted activity, what is our best guess at what was the activity of each motif, and what is an error bar on this guess, all right? So we also give for each motif in each sample an uncertainty uh, of this motif activity. <coughs> and we can use that to assign an overall significance by basically dividing the motif activity by its error bar, squaring that and averaging that. And so basically this Z value, this the Z value now summarizes how important the motif is basically is a measure of, on average, how many standard deviations away is this motif from having no activity, okay? And if you want to know what is the real, what is the actual meaning of a motif activity AMS, the actual meaning is if I were to take a promoter and I were to add a single binding site for motif M, to this promoter, the motif activity AMS is the amount by which the log expression of the promoter would go up if I add this one binding site for the motif. All right? So it's basically a measure of how much is the predicted effect of adding one uh, binding site for a motif to a promoter. Okay. So I'm now ready to show you what this analysis um, gives you on an example data set. So um, as we um, showed you in the, um, I think um, Patricia sent you links. Uh, sorry, to, Eric. Yeah. Uh, in your model, uh, the activity of each transcription factor is independent from the others? in your linear model, or you also model uh, dependency um, among different binding sites, motifs? No. No, you assume that they, they act independently, right? Yes. Right. Yes. Okay. So, I mean, okay, so, so all these things, the, there's a lot to be said. So yeah. we've, we've experimented various times with adding uh, interaction terms because yeah. <laughs> both of us are having <laughs> and uh, okay. please uh, mute your mic 
I know. <laughs> okay. Um, and so far we found that, all right, when you don't have an a priori knowledge of which motifs may be interacting, then we have basically 500 squared possible interactions. And it's very hard to avoid overfitting once you start going to such a large model space. Yeah, so, so far we have not found an effective way of taking interactions into account without starting to overfit our model. Yes, of course. So right now it's uh, just um, okay. one you. motif. We assume this linear model where each motif is independently at either adding or, or removing yeah. from the expression. Okay, thank you. All right, so uh, Patricia sent you links to some data sets. You can also find these links on, uh, on the website if I go all the way back to the beginning. Um, so, have added uh, again the, the link to the Google Doc in the chat. So okay. So uh, the, the data set that I'm going to uh, look at is the data set of mouse liver development. And so this was an RNA. So this is just a public data set that we, we took from the web. Here is the publication. Uh, it's RNA seq done at 12 time points in triplicate at each time point, starting two days before birth until 60 days after birth. And uh, as I showed, this is some of the results from this paper. And so they've done this uh, um, clustering of gene expression profiles. Uh, there are these sort of three phases, a pre-birth phase, a suckling phase, and a weaning phase. And then they show you the expression patterns of groups of co-regulated genes across the time course, and they found that uh, certain groups were um, enriched for having genes from particular pathways like glycolysis, ketogenesis, glycogenesis in the, so uh, these are these expression profiles of these different clusters of genes. All right, so this is from, uh, from the original paper, and now we will look what the predictions of MARA are if you just upload this RNA-seq data to the server. All right, so uh, if you go under example results, it's all, all the way at the, at the bottom. So here's the dynamics of mouse liver, and then the dynamics of mouse liver, where we average now the results over replicates. I will come to that in a second. All right, so if you just upload this and run it, right, so there's no parameters to set. You just upload the data and say go. Um, the results page that you will get will basically be a list of motifs sorted by the Z value that tells you how significant each of these motifs is. So the most significant motif is E2F. It has a Z value of 5.25. And then the next column will tell you what are the transcription factors that are associated with this motif. So in this case, that is the transcription E2F1. It will show you a thumbnail of the activity of this motif across the sample. So in this case, across the time course. And it will show you a sequence logo. All right. Now, in this particular case, as I said, each time point was measured in triplicate. And as Mikhail will show you later today, you can um, tell Mara that you have replicate measurements and then uh, Mara can, uh, is, the Ismara tool can automatically uh, incorporate this information and average motif activities over replicates. So we've done this for this data set and so now, if you go to the replicate average data, what you see is, of course, now there are less points in the thumbnail because now the, uh, the replicates are now all mapped to one time point. But it reorders the significance of the motifs. So once we've done the replicate averaging, actually the most important motif is now HNF4A. Uh, with the Z value of 7.61. So you also see that the Z values have actually gone up relative to, to no averaging. And this is, of course, because you get more information if you, you have uh, replicates. All right. So now what you can do is each of these um, 
names here of a motif is actually a link to more information about what this motif is doing, right? Because this is just summarizing how important are the motifs and what is a thumbnail of how they change their activity across the time course. All right, so the top motif H and F for alpha is actually well known to be a key transcription factor in hepatocyte development. So one of the reasons I, I took this example data set, there is quite some information in the literature about the liver development. And so we can basically confirm that the top motif that, that Mara predicts is in fact known to be a very important developmental transcription factor in liver development. And so here I'm showing you some pictures from a, a paper on um, HNF4 alpha is an essential for specification of hepatic progenitors from human pluripotent stem cells. And they show in this paper, for example, or they discuss that uh, HNF4 alpha controls the initiation and maintenance of several key downstream transcription factors. All right, now if you go to the uh, page for HNF4A, so uh, and I encourage each of you to actually, in a browser, try to follow along and look at the results for this mouse liver data set and see uh, what are the results that I'm actually showing you. Because the things I'm not showing on the slides, you actually can see them within the interface. So the first thing that you will see is you will get a list of the transcription factors that are associated with this motif. And in this case, there is only one, and it's HNF4 alpha, and you get some links um, to further information about this transcription factor. So this is just links in other websites. All right, so now, um, second, you will see an analysis of the correlation between the um, uh, expression of the HNF4 alpha gene and the motif activity. Uh, let me just check. So in this particular case, uh, what we report is that the um, correlation between the expression of the NF4 alpha gene, which is transcribed from this promoter here, is um, 0.53, and it has a p-value of about 10 to the minus three. Now, if you click here on this link here, which shows a plot, this plot will appear. And so now what this shows is um, the activity of HN4-alpha in each of the samples against the actual mRNA expression of HNF4-alpha in each of the samples. So each dot is a sample. Here's the, the motif activity that we infer. Here the expression of HNF4-alpha. Now this is an important point because the motif activities are entirely uh, inferred from the expression level, not of the transcription factor itself, but only of its targets. So we infer how active HNF4-alpha is from the behavior of its targets. And so by now comparing these motif activities with the actual expression of, of HNF4-alpha, you can um, uh, basically check if it indeed looks like um, the expression level of HNF4-alpha is indeed upregulated when it becomes more active. And so you see that here there is indeed a moderate correlation that HNF4-alpha tends to be higher expressed in those samples where its activity is higher with a correlation of a Pearson correlation of 0.53. Note also here that the units correspond to log 2 TPM. So we see that the, the, the absolute expression level of HNF4-alpha runs from two to the five, right? So from five to, to um, seven here is from two to the five is 32 to 128 transcripts per million. Okay, so this plot also tells you whether this thing is expressed at all and how high it is expressed. All right, so now let's for comparison uh, oh, so the one thing uh, that I should have told you also is that it also gives you a um, more detailed look at the motif activity profile. So you see that this HNF4-alpha 
its motif activity is sort of continuously increasing across development. And it starts out at minus 0.4 and it goes up to about 0.3. All right, and these error bars here show you the error bar on the motif activity in each of the samples. So to now again think, what, is the, what do these numbers mean? Minus 0.4 to 0.3, well, it basically means that the effect of a single HNF4 alpha site goes from 40% reduction of expression relative to mean expression of the gene to 30% increase of expression relative to average expression. Okay, so that's what the mean is, is motive activity. All right, <clears throat> so now um, the next motif I'm gonna show you is E2F2, E2F5. This is one motif that is actually associated with two transcription factors. So these two transcription factors, their binding preferences are so similar that we can tell apart whether E2F2 or E2F5 is the transcription factor binding to this motif. They can both bind to this motif. Okay, so you have these two. Um, these are the two promoters of these two transcription factors. And here you now see the Pearson correlation coefficient of the expression profiles of E2F2 and E2F5 with the motif activities of E2F2 and E2F5. And so what you see in this particular case is that E2F2 shows an almost perfect correlation with the motif activity, whereas E2F5 shows some correlation, but a much weaker one. In addition, the absolute expression level of E2F2 goes up to almost eight, that is like 250 transcripts per million, whereas uh, E2F5 is much lower expressed. The highest is sort of one and a half, which is sort of three transcripts per million. So the fact that E2F2 is mo both much higher expressed and correlates much be better with the motif activity suggests that in this data set, in this system, the key transcription factor uh, driving this motif activity is E2F2. Okay, so you can use this a correlation and absolute expression levels uh, to for motifs that can be bound by multiple transcription factors to basically make uh, a hypothesis of which transcription factor is actually responsible. All right, now um, in some cases you can actually find that there is a negative correlation between the activity of a motif and its mRNA expression value. So here's an example from further down the list. This is a motif CBPE. This motif's activity is also going up across the development, which means that the targets of this motif are upregulated across the time course. However, we find that the activity, as the activity goes up, the actual expression level of CEBPE goes down. So what this indicates is that in this system, CEBPE is acting as a repressor because the higher the expression level of the transcription factor, the lower the motif activity. So you can use these correlations also um, to, to find out which transcription factors are acting as activators and which transcription factors are acting as repressors. All right. Okay, so, so far I've just told you about motif activities and what they mean and how to tell whether uh, which transcription factor is responsible for a given motif activity and whether it's acting as a repressor or an activator. So the next thing we want to know about is, of course, what are the targets of each transcription factor. So Mara calculates lists of target genes in the following way. So for each motif, and I indicate here the green motif, we first find all the promoters that have predicted binding sites for the motif, okay? Because if you have no binding sites, then you, can, then you cannot be targeting that promoter. But so here there is a promoter where there were binding sites for the green transcription factor. And now we basically, in silico, remove the binding sites for this green motif from this promoter, okay? So we change the site count matrix 
by basically going into one row, namely the row of this particular promoter, and one column, namely the column of this particular green motif, and we set the entry to zero. Okay, we remove the sites for this one motif in one promoter. And then basically we redo the entire fit of Mara. And we calculate how much worse is the fit to the data set with this mutated um, side count matrix where one motif has been removed from one promoter relative to what it was with the original side count matrix. And we calculate the log likelihood of the data using the original side count matrix and this mutated side count matrix. And this then gives a score, a log likelihood score for how likely it is that um, this motif is regulating this particular promoter. All right, so conceptually, the way you can think about it is that, okay, so there is some observed expression profile of this promoter, and with our or original data set, um, when we have all motifs present, the model predicted this expression profile across the samples. But now, when we remove the binding sites for the green motif from the promoter, uh, the predicted expression turns into this red curve. And we basically quantify how much worse is the fit of the red curve than the green curve. And this log likelihood ratio SPM, so this is the target score, is basically quantifying how much worse is the fit without this green binding site in this promoter than with the binding site. <coughs> uh, for the technical among you, um, it turns out that this um, log likelihood ratio can be quite easily calculated as, as follows. You basically just, for each um, promoter and each sample, calculate the chi-square deviation between the fit and the observed expression. And then you calculate the chi-square deviation with the new side count matrix from which this one motif has been removed in one promoter. And then this log likelihood ratio is basically the difference of these chi-squares divided by the average chi-squared average across all samples and all promoters. Okay, if you want to see the derivation of why this is the log likelihood ratio, um, then I refer you to the Ismara paper where this is uh, derived in detail. Okay, so the target score measures how much the square deviation between fit and model increases when sites for the motif M in promoter P are removed relative to the average square deviation between predictions and uh, measurements across all promoters and samples. All right, and so one thing to notice is that this quantity is extensive in the number of samples. The more samples you have, the higher these target scores tend to be, okay? So it's, it's, it's like the more samples you have, the more accurately can we identify the targets of each motif. Notice that the target score can also be negative. For some promoters and some motif, it may actually, the fit may actually be better when you remove the site than when you <clears throat> All right, so the next thing that you will see on the results for this HNF4-alpha, if you go to the page of the HNF4-alpha results, is simply a list of target promoters sorted by this log likelihood score. All right, so at the top of this list, here is a gene called uh, CYP2C29. This is a cytochrome P450. Uh, family gene, and uh, it has a log likelihood ratio of 95.78, okay. So notice that uh, we also provide here a link to where is the promoter of this target gene on the genome. And if you click on this link, you will be taken um, to the Swiss Regulon genome browser view of this promoter. So this is a zoom in of the promoter of this gene. Here is the promoter, so this is in mouse. And with all the prediction binding sites in this promoter, and so you see here is the binding site for NHF4-alpha on the genome. All right, so it tells you exactly where in the genome the site is that we predict is responsible 
of this targeting of HNF4-alpha of this gene. So in principle, if you wanted, you could go and now use CRISPR or something to remove this binding site and validate that HNF4-alpha is indeed targeting this promoter in this system. All right, so we have such a list of, uh, of targets. And then, uh, now of course you can scan to this list, but uh, often there can be lots of targets of a given transcription factor. So we'd like to sort of also make summaries of what are the kind of pathways and sort of categories of genes is each of these uh, transcription factors targeting. So what we, uh, we also have further down on the page, we have um, gene ontology categories that are overrepresented among the targets of the transcription factors. Okay, so here are examples of the most overrepresented um, gene ontology categories in the biological process category uh, for HNF4-alpha. And um, there are two statistics that are given for each category. Uh, so here's a Go category. This is epoxygenase P450 pathway. It's mostly giving the total log likelihood, that is the sum of all the log likelihood target scores for genes in this pathway, and the average log likelihood per target. Okay, so you see that there, there are something like 30 genes in this pathway that each on average have a target score of about 12. Okay. <clears throat> and so you can sort these lists in various ways, and so you can get some idea of what are the pathways that this particular transcription factor is targeting in the system. Um, now, in some cases, the um, path, the genes that are targeted by a transcription factor may not have been annotated so well in terms of their gene ontology categories. And another way um, that you can learn about what kind of pathways a particular transcription factor is targeting is by um, using information from the string database. So here we, we use information from uh, the string database that is um, from Christian von Mehring's group in, in Zurich. Uh, so basically what happens is uh, for each data set, we have predicted targets for each motif, and then we send the list of these target genes for each motif to the string database. And string returns us a picture of the known connections between these genes that are targeted by this particular transcription factor. So what we see here is a picture that is coming from string that is showing, so each little ball here is one of the genes that HNF4-alpha is predicted to target in this system. And the links that you see between them are coming from the string database. These are known connections between these genes. And you can go on this picture, so you can have a link to the string database, you can go on this picture, you can see what is each of these genes and what is each of these links between the genes. So if you were to do this for this particular set of targets of HNF4-alpha, you'd see that there are a couple of clusters of genes with lots of connections between them. This cluster here are all cytochrome P450 genes. This cluster here is genes involved in the complement cascade. These are genes involved in the urea cycle, and these are genes involved in heme transport and coagulation. So with this kind of analysis, it allows you not only to see what is HNF4-alpha targeting, but to sort of take it apart into various functions that are um, performed by the genes that HNF4-alpha is targeting. All right, and then uh, finally, we all also um, predict direct interactions between each transcription factor uh, and other transcription factors. So basically what we've done is we basically take HNF4-alpha and look at all of its targets and ask which of these targets are themselves transcription factors with motifs. So in this end, so there's a little um, interaction a picture that you get where HNF4-alpha is in the middle, 
and around it are other transcription factors that are directly targeted by HNF4 alpha. And if you mouse over on one of these links, you will actually see the name of the transcription factor in question and what the target score is. So for example, um, this link here says that HNF4 alpha targets directly the promoter of NR1I3 with a target score of about 17.2, okay? If you look up what, what is this gene NR1I3, it's also known as CAR, constitutive androstein receptor, and uh, this is well-known important transcription factor um, in liver, uh, as I'm showing here from this uh, citation that I pulled out, that says that CAR promotes differentiation and maturation of hepatic-like cells. So we predict that this HNF4 alpha is directly targeting CAR and upregulating it in this system. And here are other examples. For example, second one, NR5A2, target score of 11.2. This is called the liver receptor homolog LRH1. Okay? <clears throat> so basically, um, MARA also predict for you the sort of uh, key regulatory circuitry around each transcription factor. What are the other transcription factors that are um, regulated by this transcription factor or that are regulating this current transcription factor? So for example, um, if you uh, go mouse over this link here, you see that there are actually two links, one red link going from HNF4 alpha to HNF1 alpha, and one link blue going from HNF1 alpha to HNF4 alpha. And the um, target scores associated with these are 3.6 and 4.6. And so basically the prediction is that HNF4 alpha and HNF1 alpha regulate each other. And in fact, if you go into the literature, this is known that HNF1 alpha and HNF4 alpha target each other. Okay, so this is another prediction that was coming directly out of this model analysis. All right, so just to take one other example of a motif. So we see these uh, two uh, E to F motifs that are both down regulated. So let's see what might be the role of these uh, motifs. If you look at the motif activity across time, you see that they're extremely well uh, correlated with each other. These motif activity profiles of these two factors look almost the same. And uh, this suggests that we might be looking at a single pathway. And if you now try to find out what this pathway may be, G, if you go to the string picture of the targets for this transcription factor E2F2 in this system, you see this incredibly connected ball. So the extremely high density of links in the targets of E2F2 tells you that this pathway uh, that E2F2 targets is extremely well studied, okay? That's typically what it means. If you see extremely connected string picture, it means this is a very well studied biological process. And if you just inspect what these genes are, you will see that these are all genes involved in the cell cycle and in particular genes involved in replication and, initi and initiation of replication. If you, this is confirmed when you look at the Go categories that are most overrepresented among the predicted targets of these E2F2 and E2F1, and um, you see that the most overrepresented categories are DNA replication initiation, DNA unwinding involved in DNA replication. And so uh, what you find is that these E2F1 and 2 are responsible for uh, regulating the G1S transition of the cell cycle. Okay, so the fact that this is going down across the time course basically means that the amount of uh, cell division replication is decreasing with time, across the time, uh, across the liver maturation. Okay. So um, this concludes my, my summary of um, 
the use of, of MARA on transcriptome data. And I want to now say a little bit about that you can also use MARA with chipset data to learn about transcription factors that may be re responsible for driving chromatin modifications. Okay, so we, we first developed this uh, in the context of a collaboration uh, with the lab of Dirk Schubler here in Basel. And um, we were particularly interested in testing this idea that uh, sometimes the binding of transcription factors to particular loci in the genome can recruit chromatin modifying enzymes to these loci and cause um, chromatin modifications at these loci. Okay, so this is the kind of conceptual idea that MARA can also implement. And the way we do this is that if we get chip chip or chip sec measurements of nucleosome modifications, uh, we map these two promoters, genome wide, and we basically quantify in each promoter, in each sample, the strength of this particular nucleosome modification in each of the um, promoters in each of the samples. Okay, so it's basically the number of reads from sample S mapping to a 2KB region centered at the promoter. So this is now from chipset data. So we add a pseudo count and we divide by the length of the region and uh, then we take um, a log. And so it's basically the log of the density of reads for this particular chromatin modification in each promoter across the samples. The particular, so as an example um, of an application of this approach, we were looking at a chromatin modification known as H3K27 trimethylation. So this is the trimethylation of lysine number 27 on histone 3. And th this is well-known um, modification that is put by the polycom pathway. So um, uh, the polycom repressive complex two is somehow recruited to a locus and then trimethylates histone three on lysine 27. And afterwards, these methylated histones are recognized by PCR1 complexes um, that make further epigenetic look, um, modifications that transcriptionally silence the locus. Okay, so this is a silencing pathway. And um, the key question that we were interested in is trying to learn more ab about how PRC2 is recruited to certain loci and not to other loci. And we were hypothesizing that maybe some transcription factors are responsible recruiting PRC2 to particular loci and leading to this trimethylation of lysine 27 in these loci. All right, so we get data <coughs> of embryonic stem cells that are um, uh, differentiating in vitro into two neurons. And uh, we got data from three time points, stem cells, neuroprogenitors, and terminal neurons. And we measured H3K27 trimethylation genome-wide at each of these time points. So basically, we just apply MARA to this um, histone modifications across time. And then these are the predictions of the top transcription factors. So for example, we predict that the transcription factor SNAIL transiently recruits repressive mark H3K27 trimethyl during the neuroprogenitor stage. Um, these are the targets in the string database of SNAIL. And what we see in the enrichment of, of uh, particular pathways among these targets is that the targets of SNAIL are actually highly enriched for transcription factors. That is, the uh, genes that SNAIL uh, binds to and causes to be silenced by a uh, polycomb are highly enriched to be transcription factors themselves, okay? And so maybe um, this uh, polycom pathway here in this development uh, during the neural progenitor stage 
uh, the polycomb is used to silence a whole bunch of transcription factors that you don't want to be activated. We can hypothesize that that is maybe what SNAIL is involved in in this system. So this is just to give you one example of how you can use um, MARA with chipset data from chromatin modifications. You can also use MARA from chipset data from um, transcription factor binding. Here I will show you some, an example of some analysis that, that is actually never published where we use data from uh, the lab of uh, Eileen Furlong in Drosophila mesoderm development where she measured the binding of five different transcription factors genome-wide across um, different stages in, in development. And so uh, basically what one notices is that um, the same region in the genome may be bound by a transcription factor in one stage, but not at another stage. So for example, this transcription factor, sorry, this region in the genome is bound by MEF2 at the later time points, but not at the earlier time points. Whereas for example, this region is bound by Tinman, this red transcription factor at the early time points, but not at the later time points. So the same transcription factor will bind to different subsets of promoters at different stages. And we can try to use MARA as well to understand why the same transcription factor will bind to the same region in some stages, but not other stages. And the hypothesis is that other transcription factors can basically uh, passively cooperate with each other to determine the binding, right? So the conceptual model is that let's say in the early stage, this green transcription factor uh, is expressed and the similar red, sorry. Okay, let me start over. I didn't do very well. Good. There's a region here on the genome covered by a nucleosome in general, right? Because the DNA is, is covered in nucleosomes that make it inaccessible to transcription factors. And under this nucleosome are two binding sites for the red transcription factor and one binding site for the green transcription factor. Now, in this early stage, the red transcription factor is not expressed and only the green transcription factor is expressed. But by itself, the green transcription factor cannot really compete and displace the nucleosome and it will not bind to its site. However, in stage two, the red transcription factor is now upregulated. And so both the red and the green transcription factor are both trying to bind to their sites and together they can now outcompete the nucleosome and bind to their sites. And in this way, the binding of the red transcription factor helps the binding of the green transcription factor. So you can write this down also in a simpler linear model where the binding to a particular region of motif M in sample S, so of this green transcription factor, is basically driven not only by the binding and um, the number of binding sites for this tra green transcription factor and the activity of this green transcription factor, but also facilitated by the binding of other transcription factors to the same region, All right? So when you write down this model, you will see that you get the same kind of linear model. And so uh, MARA can also be applied to basically find out which transcription factors are helping each other binding to sites as a function of stage. So when we apply this, uh, this approach to, to this data, so we, for example, find that um, uh, for, um, if you look at MEF2, it's binding across the five stages. The most important motif, not surprisingly, is MEF2 itself. Okay, so the most important uh, predictor of MEF2 binding is MEF2 binding sites. However, other important predictors of MEF2 binding that are stage specific are binding sites for Tinman, for TTK, and for Zelda. And so, for example, 
um, the prediction is that Tinman helps MEF2 binding specifically here at the second stage. Whereas Zelda is helping MEF2 bind early in development and is not helping MEF2 to bind late in development. So it seems Zelda helps um, binding early in development and not late. This is actually something that is now known in the literature, whereas this TTK seems to act to uh, repress the binding of MEF2. Okay, so it seems to oppose binding of MEF2. So this is showing you that you could also upload to Mara chipset data for a particular transcription factor and learn which other transcription factors are helping your transcription factor to bind in a stage specific way. All right, so um, the final thing that I uh, want to tell you about is how the replicate averaging of motif activities works. So um, in this example here, these are the estimated motif activities of HNF4-alpha across all samples. And as I told you, um, there were always measurements done in triplicate. So these were the first triplet, the second triplet, the third triplet. These are all the same time points. So now when you ask Mara to um, calculate average motif activities, replicate average, basically what you do is, is you tell Mara, which samples are replicates of each other. And so you basically divide the samples into groups where, each, where all the samples in one group are considered to be replicates and different groups are considered to be different conditions. And then for each group, we sample um, the activity in a sample S of this group is the average activity at the group plus some sample specific deviation. <clears throat> and we assume that the sample specific deviations are Gaussian distributed with some standard deviation sigma g. And so what we do is we now for each group optimize this standard deviation sigma g using a, a, a Bayesian procedure. And so at the end of the day, the uh, mean activity of a group of samples is given by the weighted average of the motif activities in uh, of the samples in the group. And you also get an updated error bar that is given by this expression, all right? So basically uh, what, what this says is that um, the smaller the error bars on the motif activities of the samples, the, uh, the higher the weight they're going to have in calculating the average, and the less the variation of the motif activities of a group in a sample the smaller the error bar will be for the motif activity of the group. All right, so this is the calculation that Mara does to calculate replicate averaged motif activities. Okay, and the final thing is I already told you, so, so far we've all been looking at how changes in gene expression of genes across the samples are explained by changes in motif activity. But is Mara also fits the average expression in terms of the mean activities of the motifs. I told you about this early on in the presentation. So we model the average expression of each gene averaged over all samples in terms of the mean activities of each motif also averaged over all motifs. All right, so these mean activities, when, when a motif has a high mean activity, it means that targets of this motif tend to have high absolute expression when you average over all samples. And with motifs with low activity, it says those targets of this motif tend to have low absolute expression across all samples. And so in the case of this liver maturation data set, uh, the highest uh, activities apart from HNF4-alpha are these transcription factors like NRF1, Tal1. And so the targets of these motifs tend to have high absolute expression across the entire time course. Whereas the targets of these transcription factors tend to have low average expression across the entire time course. So this mean um, activities tells you something about the motifs that are basically highly active or inactive in all samples. 
All right. So one thing I wanted to tell you about is that we've been working very hard for the last year is to try and adapt all these methods to single cells. As you all know, there is now a lot of interest in using single cell RNA-seq to uh, measure gene expression in single cells. And basically what we've been working on is adapting our approach so that we can apply MARA to single cells and find the activities of motifs in single cells. Now, because the single cell RNA-seq data is very noisy and it has very high sampling noise, <coughs> there are lots of technical challenges. And so Jeremy Breda, who is one of the tutors today, has been working on overcoming these challenges. And so the first sort of half of the problem we think we've now solved, we've now found a new way of taking care of these uh, very high sampling fluctuations that you have in single cell RNA-seq. And so the, I want to point you to a nice preprint we have about this uh, on the bioarchive and also to a tool which is called Sanity um, that is used to normalize single cell RNA-seq data. <coughs> and we're currently worry, working on how the output of this uh, sanity normalization of single cell rna seq data can be used to apply MARA to single cells. And we sort of have a beta version of this that is already working, but we're still tweaking the details. But if you have single cell rna seq data and you're very interested to try this out, you can contact us and we can look um, whether we can uh, run, do some tests and runs on your data and see um, what comes out. All right, so we hope that the official version of single cell MARA will be available uh, not too long from now. <clears throat> and the other thing, so somebody asked us about other organisms. So currently uh, we have human mouse rat E. coli. We have implemented zebrafish. So we're interested in users that have test data sets from zebrafish. Uh, that we can run to, uh, to confirm and, and, and validate uh, that there are no more bugs in our annotations. And second, uh, Drosophila, we are also in uh, the testing stages. And so we're also interested um, to hear from users that have Drosophila RNA-seq data sets that would be interested to test. And then further, uh, any um, general feedback uh, what parts of the analysis you find most helpful or most unhelpful? What are key features that are missing? Um, you can uh, contact Mikhail Pachkov, uh, who is also one of the tutors, and we always love to hear from you with uh, feedback on um, how useful or unuseful you found various aspects of the tool. All right, so with that, I'm come to the end. Um, just the acknowledgements. So uh, today's tutors, I already mentioned. So Jeremy has been working on the single cell MARA. Uh, Mikhail is really responsible for the entire web interface and for support. And uh, so Mikhail, Mikhail is also supported directly by the Swiss Institute of Bioinformatics. And I also still want to mention uh, Piotr Balwirtz, who was, um, the main developer of uh, the uh, Ismara pipeline uh, when you were still in my lab. All right, with that, I've come to the end. So I thank you all for your attention and I hope it was useful for you and uh, I'd be happy to take any questions that you might have.